American University in Bulgaria. Thank you for all. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, that uh, Yukiko uh, came to visit me and agreed to give a talk tonight. Uh, she's a professor of labor economics at Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan, Norway. And uh, Yukiko is involved in uh, female participation in the labor market, and that's what her talk will be about tonight. Thanks. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the late evening lecture. And my name is Yuki Kabe, as Jeff introduced, and uh, I teach labor economics at Hokkaido University in Japan. And uh, let me first say that thank you very much for inviting me to a AUBG, and especially to Jeff for making for making this trip possible. So I'm indeed very honored to have, to have an opportunity to present my work today. And let me just start from the, the title of the presentation. So it's Regional Variations in Women's Participation in the Labor Market. And today's talk is much of the today's talk is based on a joint research with Giorgio Brunero at University of Padova in Italy. And there are some acknowledgments there. The basically, I used some microdata from the Employment Status Survey, which I obtained under a special permission to use. OK, so general question I have had for many years is, why do people behave differently in different regions? And this, the specific question I'm pursuing in this research is why do women behave differently in different regions of the same country? The reason I say of the same country is that if it's uh, a cross-country comparison, then obviously many things are different, such as tax system, or social security system, or labor market regulations. And those things it can be easy, easily become a factor to affect women's participation in the labor market. But that's not very puzzling. And what I'm go going to show is that there is a large regional variations in female participation within the same country, not only in Japan, but in the United States, or actually around this region. So the natural question that coming out from the first question is that uh, were there any changes in the regional differences over time? Because when we see that there are big differences in the contemporary period, naturally we ask whether that was the case in the past. And also the related question is whether the women in the high participation regions, or the women living in the high participation regions worked more than women in other regions for the wrong period or not? And if not, when did the change to take place and what was the cause for the change? And I'm going to show the evidence on this last point in the context of Japan. By the way, if you have questions, please, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. And the Important question that is also related to the general question uh, the following. What does the regional differences represent? And if you know economics, we tend to think these questions in terms of a utility maximizing framework to determine the labor supply. 
And then we can think of constraints to be a factor. So you pro if you studied economics or microeconomics, you probably had about budget constraint or time constraint. So for example, our time is 24 hours per day, and that's a maximum, so you cannot have more leisure, leisure time over 24 hours. So th those sorts of constraints. And also the, the availability of childcare may differ across regions, and that might create regional differences in female participation. Or maybe the preference is a factor. What I mean by preference is that people who live in different regions may have different preferences. So if you observe some regions has low participation rate, maybe the, it, the women who live in that region do not want to work for whatever the reason is. So the differences in preferences across regions could produce regional dispersion in female participation. And the third possibility would be something like social norm. For instance, maybe at some point in time, in some regions, there is a stigma for women or married women to work, to work in work at all or work in certain occupations because that may be a signal that the husbands are not capable of supporting the family. So then that might deter women from participating in the labor market even though the constraints or preferences are not the factor to affect her participation. So, and of course we could think of something else. And these are the areas I would like to explore in the future, but not the things I'm going to talk today. Because I do, at this moment, I do not have a clear answer for these questions. But that's the kind of general issue I have been working on. So the plan of the talk is to show the data from Bulgaria and Romania, because I assume these are the regions where your geographical knowledge is probably uh, most intense, from the European Labor Force Survey. And then I talk a little bit about the United States, where the, some facts have been found on the regional dispersion in female participation. And the rest of, of the talk, I'm gonna focus on the Japanese study Giorgio and I have been doing. So to measure the participation in the labor market, the, I'm gonna use a measure called employment to population ratio. And what, what that is, is the fraction of working women divided by population. So, and working women means that those who work for pay, so do not include the volunteers or caregiving work that are not paid. For instance, caregiving, caregiving work supplied for family members. Those are not really done for the pay. So anything that is done for pay is counted as employment and how much percentage of women uh, in that situation is the measure called employment to population ratio. And I'm gonna use EPR, EP ratio interchangeably in the rest of the talk. But this is a measure I'm going to use for pretty much for the statistics today to measure the participation rate. Important point to note is that the work decision depends on age. So when you go to school, you typically do not work. And also you retire at some point in, in life and then you, you do not work either. 
and during that time, especially women, go out from the labor market because of the child, childbearing or child rearing. So the work decision depends on age. So I'm gonna focus on the age 25 to 54. And this is a table that shows the employment to population ratio of women and men for Bulgaria and Romania from the European Labor Force Survey. And what this table shows is that the participation rate of men increased from 2004 to 2010 in Bulgaria and also for women in Bulgaria, but Romania's participation rate, both for men and women, are relatively stable over time. Regarding the regional variation in female and male participation, these are the statistics I obtained from the, we obtained from the labor force survey. So Romania and Bulgaria are next to each other across the Danube River, as you know. So we tend to think that maybe the sort of the border area have similar behaviors. So I sort of arrayed the area that are close to each other in this table, but what is noticeable here is that the participation rate for women is higher in the Bulgarian side than the Romanian side. So for instance, here, the, the, in, at the Romanian side, the participation rate is 0.603, whereas in the Bulgarian side, that was 0.653. And likewise for other bordering regions. By the way, this region classification is based on something called EU NATS2. But the, the features that are common to both countries is that the Sofia and Bucharest, the capital cities, have the highest participation in, among all regions, both for men and women. And if we if restrict attention to married women, aged 25 to 54, then we also observe these regional differences in that the, across the Danube River, the Southern Bank have a high, higher participation rate, whereas the the Northern Bank have relatively low participation rate, right? and the difference is greater than the case of all women. But the fact that the capital cities have high participation rates are the same for the married women's case also. Okay, so these are the things I just talked about. So, Okay, the other thing to note is that the male participation seems to have some dispersion in Bulgaria. So male participation seems to be very high in Sofia and low in the northwestern region, which is actually not very common in other countries. And I'm gonna show the data from Japan, which shows that regional dispersion is much greater for women than for men. So that's something unique in Bulgaria, I think. Okay. Then let me move on to the US case. In the paper by Black, Kolesnikova, and Taylor compared the participation rate of white married women with a high school degree across US cities. And according to them, the cities that have highest participation rates are Minneapolis, Greensboro, or Milwaukee. On the other hand, the cities that have lowest participation rates are New York, Honolulu, Los Angeles, Miami, or Houston. And this is kind of counterintuitive in the sense that people may think, as in the case of Sofia or Bucharest, that 
cities like New York have high participation rate. People might expect that, but that is in fact not the case. New York has one of the lowest participation rate among the US, I mean, big US cities. We could do the sim similar tabulation for states. So among the US states, where is the ones that have higher participation and lower participation. And I did this tabulation and what we find was that the highest participation states are South Dakota, Vermont, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, these states. And low participation states are West Virginia, District of Columbia, New Mexico, California, and Arizona. And this is again kind of surprising in the sense that economically strong area like California or the states that contain large metropolitan area like the district, district of Columbia in fact have lower participation rates than the places like Minnesota or Wisconsin, Iowa, the northern states that do not really have big uh, cities or high, uh, I mean, high degree of uh, population concentration. So these things sometimes appear to be counterintuitive and that makes this work quite exciting. So if I ask an economist in Japan where they think the places where women work more than, other, uh, more than other regions, the immediate response is usually Tokyo, but I'm going to show that is actually not the case. Okay, but before doing that, let me just say several things about the perception about Japan in the international context. So Japan is considered to be a country where women's participation in the labor market is low and also that is the, the obstacle to economic growth. And there was a report by Goldman Sachs in 2006, uh, 2007 stating that Japan's GDP could be raised substantially as much as 15% if women's participation rate was raised. And this figure was quite popular in the sense that it was quoted in many instances, including the speech by Hillary Rodham Clinton in the APEC Women and the Economy Forum. But what is less known is that even though Japan is considered to be a country where female participation rate is low, there are substantial regional variations across regions within Japan. So in this figure, we plot the participation rate by age. So the horizontal axis is age and the vertical axis is the P ratio. The two solid lines are the participation rate for Sweden and the United States. And the Sweden is famous for the high participation by women. And the US is kind of much lower than, than Sweden. And for Japan, I divide the entire Japan into three regions, the non-urban region and urban region, and the region called the northern coastal region, which has a new, uniquely high participation rate. So if we divide the entire Japan into three, three sub-regions and plot the EP ratio for each region, women's EP ratio in each region, what we get is this. So what, what this shows is that in this northern coastal region, the red line, the participation rate is much higher than the United States for any age. And in the non-urban region, the participation is slightly lower in the 30s, but higher than the US for other age group. So the reason why Japan is considered to have low participation rate is that 
the low participation in the urban region. So that is what's driving the overall participation law in Japan. And in general, the Japan is considered to be a country where women's participation is kind of hindered by some factor. So the purpose of this Japanese study is to look at the changes from 1930 to 2010 to see whether the high participation region now had high participation in the past or not. And the, it turned out that there was some change, but more significant change occurred in the urban area. And then move on to the role of compositional change on convergence in the participation rate. And then doing something about the role of supply and demand factors, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about the final part unless I have some time left over. Okay, so the main findings is that there was a substantial convergence over the 80-year period. So what I mean is by convergence is that we see this regional dispersion which is considered to be large in the international standard but the original dispersion we have now is even smaller than what we had in the past. So that is what we mean by convergence. And then the second point I'm gonna show is that over the 80 year period, the participation in agriculture have declined and that contributed significantly to convergence. For the period after 1982, we are able to use microdata, and for that part, we could quantify the role of supply and demand factors, and what we found was that supply factors, such as childcare or cohabitation with grandparents, are responsible for the persistent differences in dispersion, whereas the demand factor is not a major factor for the period after 1982. Okay, so let me just skip the data part because these are not quite important. I mean, I mean it, it's important, but it's probably not something you care very much about. And okay, so what we do here is to divide the entire Japan into five sub-regions. Tokyo, which is um, the capital of Japan, the major city, and the so-called urban area, the area that has high concentration of population, and the northern coastal region, the region that have uniquely high rate of participation, and then for the rest of Japan, we divide the non urban region into two groups based on their participation rate in 1975. So this is for the, the, what Japan looks like, and these are the divisions we made. Tokyo is this tiny area, tiny green area. And the urban region, the blue area, are the outskirts of Tokyo and the so-called Aichi Prefecture, where the headquarter of Toyota Motor Corporation is located, this area, and also the region called the Kansai Metropolitan Area. So those are classified as urban region. The northern coastal region, the region that has uniquely high participation rate, are the red regions the northern coast of the Honshu Island, so-called Honshu Island, this big island. And for the rest, I, I, as, I, as I explained before, we just divide the prefectures according to the level of participation in 1975. Okay, so the left chart shows the level of employment population ratio over time from 1930 to 2010, 
And as you see, that the participation rate was kind of constant, slightly increasing from 1930 to 1975, and then increased more rapidly afterwards. But with that development, what actually happened in terms of regional variation is that the standard deviation of the, uh, of the participation rate of 47 prefectures basically declined over time from 1940 to 2010. So the regional dispersion declined over time, and that is visually seen in the right chart where we plot the EP ratio of the five regions I defined in the previous map over time. And these are all for age 25 to 54. Tokyo, the major city, started with a very low rate in 1930, but the participation rate in Tokyo increased over time. And then it surpassed the other urban regions and almost, yeah, almost close to the lower category of non-urban regions in 2010. So in the past, the non-urban regions have much higher participation rate, but what happened over time is that the, uh, the low rate of participation, uh, low rate in urban areas caught up with the high level of participation in non-urban areas. So for the case of Japan, the unique feature is that high participation is the phenomena in non-urban area and in urban area participation has been quite low. And that has a certain degree of persistence in the sense that this order of regions have not changed over time, even after 1982. If we compare women and men, this is what we get. So the left figure is same as the previous slide. The right figure is the EP ratio of men plotted for the five sub-regions. And as we see, the it's kind of hard to distinguish which region is which. And note that the vertical axis is from 0.4 to 1 for men and 0.2 to 0.8 for women. So the length of the vertical axis is said to be the same. So therefore, what you see visually is actually the degree of regional dispersion for men and women. So what we see from this is that for men, there is very small regional dispersion in the participation rate, whereas for women, the dispersion is substantial. It turned out to be that the important factor contributing to the development of convergence. So what, this is what we call convergence in the sense that the EP ratio of different regions converged over time. So converged to a sim more similar, I mean, similar levels. The convergence was achieved by the decline in agriculture. And to show that, we divide the, or oh, actually, yeah, we decompose the EP ratio into three sectors agriculture, manufacturing, and other sectors. Then if you run some statistics, you, you know that the variance of the left-hand side is equal to the expression in the right-hand side. And uh, this is what we get for the participation in each sector. And we see that the agricultural participation, which is the percentage of people working in agriculture divided by population has had large regional dispersion in the past, but agriculture declined everywhere over time. And in the recent period, there is not much regional dispersion. And for the other sectors, 
other than agricultural manufacturing, the regional dispersion is quite small for women, even, even smaller than for, than for men. But there are some dispersion in manufacturing, and in fact, the red line that represents the northern coastal region have high rate of manufacturing participation. But what's notable here is that, as we showed before, the male participation has much smaller regional dispersion. Yet, if we see the, if we look at the dispersion in individual sectors, actually male participation has greater dispersion than female participation in sectors. And what, what that happens can be seen in this decomposition. So individual variances are, in fact, greater for males than for females, but the covariances uh, take large negative values for women, uh, sorry, for men, but not such negative values for women. So large negative covariance or zero covariance or even positive covariance means is that whether in the region that have high manufacturing participation has high agriculture, agricultural participation or not. And for the case of men, what happened was in the region that had high manufacturing participation tend to have low participation in other sectors. So for the case of men, if one region have manufacturing, then the, there are less participation in other industries, other sectors. But for the case of women, in the region that have high agricultural participation also have high manufacturing participation, and that is most notable in the northern coastal region, where the sector participation, all of them, more or less, have the highest position than, than other regions, whereas for the case of men, that have, if some region have high participation in one sector, that region tend to have low participation in other sectors. So that is the role of sector. And for my recent period, we can use micro data, so individual data. So therefore, we are able to disaggregate by education and marital status. So as I have been showing, there is significant regional variation in female participation. But if we disaggregate by education and marital status, this is what we got. So the horizontal axis measures year, in this case, 1982, from 1982 to 2007. And the vertical axis is the P ratio. And we have two education groups, less than courage and courage or over. And two marital status groups, single and married. So there are four cases. Two, two by two cases. And then what we see here is that when we plot the EP ratio of five regions, the dispersion for single women is quite small for both education groups. So the participation in, of single women is kind of close to men's participation. The big difference in participation comes from that, of, that from married women. But what's notable here is that the Tokyo or urban region have the lowest participation rate for both education groups of married women. And the northern coastal region have high, highest participation for both education groups. And actually, there was a convergence after 1982, which can be seen from this picture. So from 1982 to, to 2007, there was some convergence, even though it may not have been as big as from the previous time. But unfortunately, for the previous 
prior to 1982, we are not able to use microdata, so we cannot really separately analyze the participation by education and marital status. But anyway, uh, even after 1982, there was convergence. But for that convergence, actually, what is important is the compositional change. What I mean by compositional change is that the overall EP ratio of women, married and single combined, for instance, can be affected by the proportion of married people in the population. And actually, the proportion of married people differs significantly across regions. And this is what we have. In Tokyo, the percentage of married people is much lower than other regions. And as you know, that the marriage rate have declined over time, and that is shown as a declining tra trend in both figures. So the left figure is for the period of 1955 to 2010, and the right figure is 1982 to 2007. And for the right figure, I separate two education groups. And this trend is quite clear. The declining trend is quite clear. And what the decline in marriage, decline in marriage rate does in terms of regional dispersion is that it has an effect to decrease the dispersion, even though the participation behavior does not change over time. The reason is that the gap between married, married and single is greater in urban areas than in non-urban areas. So the single people have mostly similar participation in participation rates in five regions, whereas married people have this dispersion. So the gap between single and married are greater for the urban area. But if the proportion of single people increases, that has an impact to increase the overall EPS ratio of women, but that impact is greater for the urban areas. And since the overall participation rate is lower in urban areas than in non-urban areas, the fact that the urban areas participation increase more have uh, effects to decrease uh, dispersion. So even though the participation itself, so these, these profiles do not change at all, the fact that the marriage rate have fallen has an effect to produce some of these convergence. So it's important to quantify how much of the convergence uh, after 1982 is attributable to the compositional change. And if we do that, we can do some calculation of that. What we get is that the one third of the convergence is due to the compositional change. Okay, and uh, we do some regression analysis and what we found is that the time series change from 1982 to 2007 is not explained by the supply factors. What we, what we mean by supply factors is that the change in childcare or cohabitation with grandparents, these things affect the, sub, uh, the supply side or household side of the labor market, but these things haven't really moved in a way to favor the higher participation by married women. So the change in supply factors are not really the reason for the change between 1982 to 2007. But the reason why we have the persistent regional differences across five macro regions, for instance, are 
due to the persistent differences in supply factors such as childcare or cohabitation with grandparents. What I mean is that the northern coastal regions that have uniquely high, part, uh, high participation rate or over a long time also have a high supply of childcare. So that allowed married women in that region to participate in the labor market more than women in the other regions. So that's what we find from the regression analysis. And just to summarize the conclusion from the Japanese study, there was substantial convergence in the female EP ratio from 1930 to 2010. And when we disaggregate by education and marital status, convergence has been modest from 1982 to 2007. So when we disaggregate the convergence, I mean, there are some convergence, but they are relatively modest. For the time series changes, demand factors, I mean, since the supply factors are not really quite explaining the changes occurred over time, probably the demand factors have been responsible. And also the analysis from earlier periods showed that the sectoral composition, which is a demand factor, was the, one of the major causes for the convergence over time. The decline in agriculture was a major cause for the convergence. But su supply factors such as childcare or cohabitation with grandparents explain the persistent cross-sectional differences in participation. So these are what we found from a Japanese study. And why this all change have occurred is something we haven't really figured out yet, but what seems to have happened is that the agricultural participation declined everywhere, and that accompanied the decline in female participation overall. But what's notable in some region, in this case the northern coastal region, is that when the agricultural participation declined, manufacturing participation replaced the, or took over the female participation, whereas such changes did not occur in other non-urban regions which experienced similar decline in agriculture. And my interpretation of this phenomenon is that the northern coastal region attracted the capital inflow in the sense that the manufacturing establishment chose to locate in that region in an expectation to hire cheap female labor. But that factor also encouraged supply of childcare in the northern coastal region than in other regions. So childcare industry, uh, those things kind of reinforced each other to sustain the high participation in female participation in that northern coastal region, but not in other regions. So this is a region that has, has the highest participation rate and the, the, that is the kind of interpretation why that, that region sustained uh, high participation among Japanese regions over time. So I stop here and uh, take questions and comments. Thank you very much. I mean, 
what policy can do is relatively limited. I mean, that's my interpretation. So, I mean, many studies have found that the child care supply in the region have an effect to increase participation, but those things are kind of endogenous in the sense that if women wish to work, there will be a demand for child care, and then the fact that there is a demand induced the supply of child care, so that sort of thing. So they, I mean, if you started to say policy, I guess the policy question would be what would be the impact of having more child care on supply, but I mean, I mean participation. But it, I mean, in this case, it is not so easy to argue that the reason this region have higher supply of childcare is because of the policy. I mean, it's not, it's probably not really because this region had some different policies from other regions and therefore there are higher supply of childcare there unlike the other regions and that is the reason why this region have high, higher participation than elsewhere. That sort of story is not really the, the kind of things we can figure out from the data we have. Because, I mean, the main difficulty is it is so easy to argue that policy is also endogenous. And and in fact, the other kind of policy, for instance, there is this Equal Employment Opportunity Law enacted in 1986 and enhanced in 1999 and 2007. But this policy is supposed to have enhanced the female participation so that the women can have career and family simultaneously, but at least in the case of Japan, what ha seems to have happened is that people or women reacted by the decline in marriage. So the first reaction after the enactment of the Equal Employment Opportunity Law is that people postpone or, or choose not to marry. And what happened was, this, I mean, if you look at the part participation, or actually slightly different measure of participation before the law and after the law, what seems to hap have happened is that married women's participation did not change and single women's participation did not change either. It's just that the uh, compositional change. So people, uh, well, women, started to postpone marriage, and that has an impact to increase participation, but it didn't have an impact to increase the participation by married women. But that might have changed over time. So the law was first enacted in 1986, and my observation, or this is from my other paper, but my observation is that for the first 25 years, things haven't changed much. But maybe now, or shortly from now, they, the participation by married women may, may have started to increase, especially in places like Tokyo. Not, not in the data, oh, wait. Well, we, we kind of see that the participation rate by college-educated women in Tokyo increased more than other non-urban regions. But if we look at more narrow definition of work, such as regular employment, not including part-time employment, this tendency is kind of different. But Changes might be occurring in Tokyo right now, but that doesn't really 
observable in the data yet. But changes might have been occurring right now. But I tend to think that they are not really because of the policy. I mean, policy hasn't been not quite effective in promoting the career and family kind of choice. And the, one of the main difficulties for the case of Japan is that we do not really have many immigrant workers who are coming to Japan to supply the caregiving services. And the reason I say this is that for the case of the United States or some countries in Europe, it seems like that child care or caregiving to the elderly uh, supplied by immigrant workers. And there are papers that argues those things are, op and those, those forces are operating. But for the case of Japan, it's not really directly visible to have uh, immigrant workers supplying uh, care services that allows women to pursue career and family. So, I mean, that's not the content of our study, but that seems to be one of the factors which are quite different from Japan and other developed countries. Yes. Marriage rate is declined. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, unmarried women participate in the labor force mm -hmm. for higher rates than married women. And we may have uh, talked around it a little bit, right? But one is taught and the other is taught. Mm -hmm. It seems like you, you might construct a story in either direction. You could either say participation rate overall is rising mm -hmm. because the marriage mm -hmm. rate is falling. Mm -hmm. What it might say that more women are choosing mm -hmm. the participate in labor force lifestyle and therefore the uh, cause of marriage rate to fall. And or it may be something else which is driving both of us. Mm -hmm. And so do you have any I haven't really worked on a story that, okay, so basically trying to treat the marriage decision, decision to be endogenous, you know, but I guess, yeah. Yes, I, I think that is, pro, I, I mean, that is an important question uh, in a theoretical point of view. But many of the things I have presented today or, or in other papers is more like this descriptively showing what happened after the law or what happened over time across regions. And yeah, I guess uh, trying to answer that question, what we need is probably treat some exogenous change in demand I mean, labor demand or labor market regulations. So there is some exogenous factor that was different from before. So, I mean, there are two possibilities. Uh, one is the anti-discrimination policy. So women now can work in the labor market unlike in the past. So whether that had any impact in the behavior of marriage and participation simultaneously. That, that's one possibility. So treating the change in the law as an exogenous factor. The other possibility is that there is a sort of long run change in the demand structure in the labor market. So for instance, the labor market skills that are valued have changed over time. For instance, language skills become more important in the recent times, or more generally, the skills required in the global setting is different from the skills needed in the past. And 
obviously these things affect uh, women's participation or demand for women's labor. So treating those things as an exogenous factor and try to think how, the, how those affect my behavior and participation behavior, but I haven't really, I guess to do that probably need somewhat more structure in the model and try to fit the data to the model, but I haven't really worked on the structure. Modeling of that phenomenon. Yes. How do you discuss women in the group of single and married? Like, is that legal marriage, or and how do you count domestic partnerships if they? Exist? They are. I mean, in this case, uh, they are included in the married groups. The domestic partnerships is included in the married case. Actually, uh, I think I prepared, uh, yes. So this is uh, variances, oh, actually standard deviations and covariances. So the, these are the square root of the variances. But the covariances are the important factor. And then for men, the covariance is a, uh, well, it's kind of small number, but always ne almost always negative and large in absolute value. Whereas for the case of women, sometimes negative, but sometimes positive, even positive. Positive means that in the region where the agriculture, agricultural participation is high, then the manufacturing participation also tend to be high. That kind of positive covariances is observed in women in certain cases. And even though the values are negative, the absolute values are smaller than the case of men. So if we look at, for instance, these two covariances, I mean, this covariance is 10 times greater than the, this covariance. So, Seems like these women will only take work in a particular type of sector, a particular type of job, or there are lots of women working on a particular type of jobs. So either the jobs are there for women or they're not. That, that seems to be the instance of what is very sad. Yes. Well, actually, probably, I mean, this is kind of the demand factor story in the sense that we are looking at the uh, participation in different sectors. So the dim, dim, so these are kind of the demand side of the labor market. But what we see as positive covariance is our, what we think about this co positive covariance is that maybe supply factors are so important for women. So in the region where women work, in agriculture, women also work in manufacturing. And what's driving those participation in different sectors might be just a supply factor such as childcare. So the, in the region where childcare is supplied more, it allows women to work in any sector. And that might create the positive or small negative covariances, even though the demand factors should be, shouldn't be too much different because they are in the same regions as men. So 
you. Thank you for coming. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu/talks.